I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker. So uh, Nikita is the founder and CTO at Grid Gain Systems, he, uh, which he started in 2007. He has led GridGain to develop advanced and distributed in-memory data processing technologies, the top in-memory computing platform, uh, starting, which starts multiple times per second every day around the world. Nikita has over 20 years of experience in software application development, building HPC and middleware platforms, contributing to the efforts of other startups and notable companies, including Adaptech, Visa, and BEA Systems. Nikita was one of the pioneers in using Java technology for server-side middleware development while working for one of Europe's largest system integrators in 1996. He's an active a member of, Java middleware, of the Java middleware community, a contributor to the Java specification, and holds a master's degree in electromechanics from Baltic State Technical University in St. Petersburg, Russia. Please join me in welcoming Nikita to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me, right? It's a little bit unusual. So I typically don't speak into this microphone. Okay, excellent. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming in. Um, I get to speak to this conference a couple of times. It's always uh, fascinating to see so many familiar faces and yet so many new faces. Um, for all of you coming from elsewhere, welcome to California. Welcome to our hellish traffic. It took me like an hour and a half to get here, and I live nearby. So uh, what I want to talk today uh, about in the next 30 minutes is literally talk about a future with memory computing. Uh, I've been doing this for literally about 20 years by now. I literally started doing in-memory stuff in late, late 90s. And... Um, so I, I, I do have some perspective on, on the topic. Uh, I've seen this technology kind of evolve uh, in many different directions over the years. Um, I started regaining the Apache Ignite project you know, along the way and seen that evolve and seen our customers evolve. So I can probably give you a little bit of a personal perspective where I think the technology uh, will evolve, what trends will be important in the next maybe five, 10 years. A lot of this will be fairly, you know, obvious to many of you, um, I believe, but some things may be quite interesting as a, as a kind of, you know, um, uh, in the commentary and look at it. So before we uh, look at the future, let's look at the past. And uh, it's always, you know, fascinating when I talk to customers and, and um, just anybody who wants to talk about a memory computing, everybody thinks that a memory computing is something relatively new something that happened in the last 15, maybe 10, 15 years. And in fact, you know, we've had in memory computing, which is, you know, original names of basic caching, you know, we had it from the first days of computers, you know, late in the 50s and 60s, we already have in memory computing, if you want to call that. We you know we literally call it a, just a caching. But really, the, the, the term, um, the, the time frame where the caching became really is something a little bit more than just some kind of, you know, a you know, instrument in operating system in kernels was around the mid-90s, is when essentially the caching became something that the programmers could talk about as a topic. And the idea of a caching is very simple, right? There's a big difference between speed and capacity of external storage and speed and capacity and cost of the RAM, right? RAM is more expensive, dramatically faster and smaller, and almost reverse goes for external storage. So it kind of made sense to try to keep as much data in RAM without constantly going back to your database and disk and tapes back and that. So that's, that's the fundamental idea. And it's still, still to this day, is the fundamental idea with memory computing. That's all there is to it. There's a lot of complications and details, but that's about it. So back in the early 90s, uh, we had literally what I usually call no distribution, right? You know, remember, you know, early, early 90s, mid 90s, we had no distribution. In a little, it was one computer or one mini, mini frame or one main frame, mini computer, mini frame. You know, the capacity of storage was kilobytes, maybe megabytes. And that's basically was a very simple, non transactional, essentially key value store. The next evolution came um, literally uh, towards the end of 2019s and the beginning of 2000s is that really uh, we kind of realized that 
why don't we, you know, uh, grab together multiple computers? And back in those days, if you remember, many of you will remember, the idea of distributed programming, networking programming was really flourishing. And you know, it was a lot of, you know, TCP IP was developed about a decade before that. Uh, and the idea came around, so why don't we, you know, grab multiple computers together and see what happens? And obviously, as most of you appreciate, you know, when you go from one computer to two or many, the complexity, you know, has a step function in terms of complexity. Things become complex. You know, how do we synchronize that? How do we keep it consistent? You know, what do we do with all those different things? How do we program that? That was the first kind of iteration of a complex in terms of memory computing. And as a matter of fact, again, uh, we're dealing with this today. Everything that we've developed since late 90s to today is a continuation of the same idea. You know, we just get more features, more complications, more sophistication in this in these products and projects. But fundamentally, this is the idea of what we're dealing today. So, in, in the last maybe um, I would say um, seven to maybe ten years, uh, the idea of the memory data grids came around, and that's basically, for example, where Apache Ignite and Grid Gain started out uh, as a memory data grid. So, the memory data grids are literally again an extension of distributed caching idea with addition of transactions, distributed transactions, and kind of a more of a um, more of APIs. Sometimes we have, we always have key value APIs, but sometimes we added some kind of query capabilities and whatnot. And probably the latest, latest iteration on the same idea of in memory computing or distributed caching is what we call memory computing platforms. And that's just the basically terminology for a much broader set of APIs to the same data that's stored in memory. So typically memory computing platforms would have a SQL, have a streaming, Obviously, have multiple ways of transactions. It could be multi-model approach, where not only you know you have a key value, you have analytical, you know, columnar stores and whatnot. So that's the idea in a landscape of uh, kind of in memory computing transitions say, for the last 25, 30 years. So once again, we went through or from a very simple, non-distributed single computer caching, and we went all the way to today, where we have a a massively distributed systems that can store in memory terabytes of data. I mean, we have vendors here, including Regain. You know, we have installations over thousands of nodes and clusters in production with terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes of data stored in memory and processed there. So that's, you know, the kind of landscape and the roadmap of what happened. So having this kind of as a background, as a context, let's talk about what I believe is going to be the kind of main trends uh, going forward. Now, none of that is anyhow unique or you know, eye-opening, but nonetheless, it's kind of cool to look at it as a whole. So the first of all, we're going to talk about individual, about all of them, but you know, we're going to have a new product, memory products. That's already not, it's, it's not a future tense, you know, we already have new products. You guys can stop by Sneer and talk about all the different types of you know, RAM that's already available, like Intel Optane and, and non-volatile RAM, and, and this you know, area is blossoming. Uh, it has a slow uptake, you know, it, because it requires, it's a hardware. It requires device changes, you know, it requires the integration with operating, operating systems and languages, but nonetheless, it's happening. We'll talk about it. The HTAP adoption and multi-modeling. You know, HTAP stands for High Transactional Analytical Processing. This is the big deal. It's, again, it's a slow-moving trend, but it's inevitable, and we'll talk about it, too. The cloud enablement. I mean, you know, it, obviously, it already sounds like, a, you know, yesterday's news, but nonetheless, in memory computing products are one of the last to really jump on a, a fully cloud native architectures, and we'll talk about it, why. There's, there's a clear reason why it's, it's much harder for us to do that than for, you know, other projects in the industry. And we'll talk about user friendliness and simplicity, which is kind of in my personal pet peeve on memory computing. So, new types of memory. This is an interesting topic. I mean, I've been, you know, following SNEER and participating in conferences and really following this subject for many, many years. And uh, it's funny, you know, I remember like almost 10 years ago when we all thought that, you know, the non-volatile RAM will be an absolute revolution. And we still think the same way. You know, uh, it's, it, it has this tremendous lag time that you have to go as an industry, as a basically ecosystem to really adopt new types of hardware, especially in the memory. But it's inevitable. The new types of memory is here to stay. Look at the Intel Optane. Finally, we have something that you can, you can actually purchase. You know, there is a, 
something you can rent on the cloud. Uh, the non-volatile RAM is there. Now, many of you may be asking, what's the big deal? You know, we've had, you know, RAM disks and whatnot. The biggest difference is that, you know, when you have actual a new type of RAM, like a non-volatile RAM, it is a, it, it is a RAM. It's a byte addressable device. It's not something that hides behind the block level access, like, you know, your RAM disks, for example, where you still have to use the file system APIs to access it. The new RAM is the RAM. You know, you can program in your languages, you know, GVM or .NET or anything else, and use, basically it's still a RAM for you. You don't really know it's a disk. It's a RAM. It's just a lot of it, or it's basically non-volatile. So when you plug, plug the computer and plug it back, it's still there. Now, it creates a whole bunch of issues in and of itself, but nonetheless, this is one of the area that I, every year I have this presentation somewhere, somehow, and I keep saying the same things, but eventually it will happen. <laughs> eventually, this will happen. And, you know, I believe at this point we're still waiting for a better BIOS support, for better operating system support, for better cloud enablement. But it is a, a literally inevitable uh, direction where we're going. If you probably talk to me in 10 years from now, let's say 10 years to a decade, I can almost guarantee you that almost every device we're going to be talking about, it, phones and laptops and, you know, and blades and data centers, would have a non-volatile RAM. There's absolutely no reason why the RAM has to be volatile, especially we know, when we have dealing with large, large clusters of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of computers in the cluster where nodes coming up and down, it creates you know, a completely unnecessary uh, cost when the RAM basically you know, clears out on the power outage. It doesn't have to be, and it will not be. And uh, in-memory computing software is going to be the first one to, to get, take advantage of that in, in, in a pure way. Uh, we are again working on it very actively, and you know, working with you know Intel, for example, to add the support. And I know the many other projects do as well. So the biggest thing again, the, you know, one of, the, one of the trends, and one of the real, real trends is real adoption of a new types of RAM. And uh, just another comment about this, you know, it doesn't happen very often. Remember, like, what was the last time, think about it in your careers back, when was the last time we actually had a new type of RAM? I guarantee most of you were born and developed your careers with one type of RAM, which is the RAM, the DRAM, right? Since you went to the high school, colleges, it was the same RAM. You unplugged the power, you lost everything. You know, it changed the capacity, changed the speed, but nonetheless, it was the same device. It was developed by Intel back in whatever, 60s. So we literally have, with Intel Optane, for example, the whole Optane technology, it's the first time in like half a century when we have an actual new physical device and the new physical principles. So it's a pretty big deal. And uh, as it, you know, matures in the market, you know, the memory computing products will be the first to adopt it, one, one of the first. Another interesting trend um, that, again, a fairly slow moving, but again, very much inevitable, is a move to the hybrid transactional analytical processing. Uh, it sounds like a marketing term, and it is, uh, but it, it's, um, it, it's always kind of interesting for me when I talk about it to the customers. I sometimes get to ask this question, can somebody explain to me why do we have a two different universes of IT, one for transactional processing, for all of you guys, all TP processing, and a complete different universe of products and technologies for analytical processing, which is where we're historically named OLAP. And the younger crowd cannot even explain this. For any of us, you know, 30 and below, we just don't know. We have no idea. Why do we have this bifurcation? Why do I have to buy a transactional system and then buy an analytical system? And then I have this, have this ugly, slow ass process of moving data from one system to another. 20 years ago, we'll have a gigabyte, fine. It took like a few minutes. Today, we're moving petabytes sometimes, and it takes weeks. And, you know, we have all these ugly processes where like Amazon allows you to basically move disks physically from one computer to another, which is faster than moving data over the network. So why do we have that complication? And the reason for that is that historically, when the systems were developed, you know, in the 60s and maybe 70s, the, the, performance were, the performance differences were staggering. You know, for OLTP systems, for transactional systems that run your business, you have to have a fairly fast performance. Analytical systems cannot work on the same data because that would slow down dramatically the transactional processing. 
And these differences really did drive the bifurcation. So we end up having two different systems, one for transactional processing and one for completely different analytical processing, and we're constantly moving data between them. A lot of folks don't realize that that's the fundamental reason for that, and we kind of we used to live in this, in this, this paradigm. Think about it, you know, anybody in the real businesses like banks and whatnot, you guys experience this every day. Stop for a second and ask, why do you have that? Why can you not run your ML or just the basic analytics on the same, let's say, database that you run your transactional processing? Even simple example, pick your you know, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, you run transactions on it, right? You run your business. Why can't you run an ML on it? Why can't you train your models? Why can't you just do the basic analytics on that or you know, long-term SQL query? The reason for that is, you know, there may be many reasons, but one of the fundamental reasons is performance because one will affect another. And a memory computing is really one of the first technologies or maybe one of the only one today that can bridge this two. Simply because IMC really gives you the tremendous, a maximum raw hardware power. You really don't waste any cycles going to the you know, external storages and whatnot or going through a stack of operating system calls. If you keep your data co-located, properly co-located in the cluster and in RAM, that's what most of us do in memory computing, right? You can run transactions and you can run analytics on the same data without any significant loss of speed and performance. And that's, you know, what really drives, you know, if you, for example, ask me, like from grid game perspective, the company, uh, a lot of our customers, if you dig down into the use cases, where do they use in memory computing? Where do they use, uh, like, let's say, our product, grid gate or Ignite, Apache Ignite? Uh, you'll find that in many, many cases, this is the, a move by the companies into this hybrid approach is where they don't want to have any more ETLing between the systems and they want to basically have a, a much simpler and much our uh, cheaper overall system by just having a one large cluster that runs both transactions, ML, and analytics on the same data without any move, need to move it out. Another word here is a multi-model. Again, it's something that actually I've added like recently to the slide deck. And the multi-model becomes a really, really big deal. It may be a little bit kind of a cross-sectional you know, feature. It doesn't really apply specifically to in-memory computing. But you know, for example, we've seen a lot and a lot more than you know. Uh, most of the projects today need both, let's say, SQL store, like you know, typical raw call, raw store. They need a dedicated, you know, a time series capability, which is a very different type of you know storing data. They need dedicated analytical processing, which is typically done much better on a column store than a row store. So what you're going to see from a lot of you know a data storage vendors and the project is a really support for multi model. Because again, the, the, the days of, hey, let me get you know, something for SQL, something for analytics, and something else for time series, and then trying to cobble together this monstrosity in terms of the you know, DevOps and configuration, th those days are pretty much gone. You know, most of the developers have no patience for that. They're looking for a, a product that, that, give, that will give them in a very simple and easy way to do a multi-model data processing. Surprisingly, you know, if you ask me like three years ago, I wouldn't say it's a big trend. I would say it's a more of a kind of an edge case, which we see, you know, once in a while. You know, we at Grid Game, for example, we've seen it literally, I would say, almost on a weekly basis in terms of the, the demand and what people are really expecting from products. So, you know, in memory computing being a data management technology, uh, we should be seeing this, we will be seeing this, you know, as, as, as a trend going forward for sure. So the next one is cloud native architecture. And uh, this is actually one of the two pet peeves that I have personally. You know, for many of you, it will sound like a little bit strange topic. You know, why are we talking about you know, cloud enablement in the end of 2019? Everybody's done already. We're past that you know, by a decade by now. And yes, you know, there are many different products where this uh, cloud enablement of fully managed services or cloud native, whatever you want to call it, um, is rather simple exercise. You know, if you look at the products like you know, MongoDB or MemSQL or Cassandra for that matter, or Redis, they are very simplistic APIs. Simplistic in a, in, a, in a good way, not in a negative way. It's basically either SQL or, very, or some kind of proprietary REST API or something that has a very distinct difference between a client that calls out APIs to a certain protocol on a server. And therefore, you can put the server 
somewhere in the cloud, and you know, you're basically cloud enabling with this done. The rest of it is just a basically a basic UI management and how you manage these installations. In, in memory, data grades, and that's where the, uh, a, a large portion of the memory products really derive from, you know, products like Hazelcast, Apache Ignite, the grid gain, and Gigaspace, and Coherence, and list goes on and on, scale-out software. Uh, for those projects, uh, the API is really programming language. And there's a, a tremendous technological problem in how do you do deployment, how do you do secure deployment on the cloud when instead of just issuing the SQL commands or REST commands, you actually write and code in a variety of different languages, from C universe to .NET to GVM languages to a variety of you know, Pythons and R's and JavaScripts. How do you manage all of that to be transparently deployed and managed in the cloud? You know, if you think about it, I know it's a lot more than just you know, a few minutes of conversation. If you think about it, nobody has solved it yet. You don't have that on Amazon or Google or Azure or anywhere else in any automated way. You can do it manually, right? But manual process is extremely awkward. I mean, you can build your Docker images every time and deploy them, but that's going to be extremely clunky process. So that's one of the reasons why you know, many of the in-memory data grid derived projects haven't really moved in a fully managed kind of native cloud architecture, not because of a laziness or a lack of awareness of the need, but because of a tremendous technological problem that it really presents. And, uh, and, and I truly saying this is, you know, I have a little bit of a, you know, kind of a vendor mentality here, but if you ask any other vendors in the same group, they're all here. They'll tell you pretty much the same story. We're at the forefront of development of a memory computing. We have one of the most complicated systems in the world, and yet we're all lagging by getting into the cloud. It will be changing, of course. I mean, none of those problems are unsolvable in theory. They just, unsolved, they just basically require a, in a dramatically more engineering work than something that is, it has a much simpler API to the product. Lucky I already mentioned the other products as well. But nonetheless, this is one area that I think um, many of us in the community understand the importance of. Uh, from commercial perspective, from just in you know, a basic technological perspective. Again, uh, I always keep giving this example. Uh, one of the customers in the Green Gain Systems is a Barclays bank in, in, in the UK. And it's a very conservative bank, extremely conservative. Uh, everything's a conservative thing in England, right? And, and Barclays is conservative in England. And uh, I remember when I met them, you know, whatever, four or five years ago, they basically told me, like, Nikita, we're Barclays. We're not moving to the cloud, right? It's you, you kids in Silicon Valley can do that. You know, we're real business here. So we acquire our own hardware. We have our own data centers. You know, we're doing a real deal. And uh, it's fine. You know, it's very typical for uh, this type of businesses. And when I met them about a year and a half ago, there was a bank-wide initiative. Everybody moves to the cloud. Everybody. And let me tell you, when Barclays moves to the moves to the cloud, you basically you're done. Everybody moves to the cloud because this is one of the most conservative organizations in terms of IT. And uh, so we will be seeing this. Uh, we already seen this, obviously. But even for um, the the late laggards from a technology perspective, we're all going to be forced to become you know very much cloud native. We're all going to be forced to solve that you know thorny problem of how do we deploy this complex software that you write every day on a cloud infrastructure so in, a kind of, in, a, in a some automated way. Again, it's a much longer conversation, by the way. I'm, I'll be here in the conference. I can talk about it endlessly. But uh, it is something we're going to be solving in the next five to 10 years, for sure. And we're going to solve it much early, by the way, most of us. But nonetheless, this is the biggest trend. And finally, uh, the really. The last one, actually, let me go back for a second. Yeah, this one. This is the biggest pet peeve for me, personally. And somebody who spent you know, a good portion of my career, almost over 20 years, I've been developing a variety of systems, sort of memory computing systems. Uh, the one overriding theme for this type of software, it's goddamn complex. And it's unnecessarily complex. I mean. E e 
I've done dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of presentations in the meetup talks. I've met hundreds upon hundreds of engineers, not thousands, over the years. And one overriding theme is it gives tremendous power, tremendous performance. Nothing can give you better performance than memory computing, in theory. But it comes with a enormous complexity cost. At least in the past, we're trying to solve it better and better, but in the past it is. Uh, it is actually undeniably true that in memory computing systems, especially modern in memory computing systems, those that are actually massively distributed are one of the most complex systems in existence. Not only are you changing completely the way you think about a data, right? Think about, you know, if you think about databases, you're thinking about, you know, a block level devices, you know, it's a very different paradigm. Uh, how do you fetch the data, how do you load data, how do you process data versus in memory where everything is in RAM, where everything is better addressable, but not beyond that, you almost always have a large distributed systems. Not only have to, so you have to marry a, a different way to store data and think about a data with a, a massive parallel processing and distribution. And you have to essentially be fluid in these concepts. You have to rethink every algorithm that you ever thought about. Starting from basic, you know, basic data processing like sorting and whatnot, all the way to SQL processing, all the way to MPP and you know your machine learning algorithms and everything else. It's a big deal. And if you ask me personally, you know, what is the biggest inhibitor in an adoption of memory computing? It's complexity, no doubt. Everything else is distant secondary that we discussed. The biggest inhibitor to adoption of memory computing is the complexity of it, and therefore, it is up on us vendors and the project leaders, you know, really solve that problem. And um, there's progress in this. There's progress in this. There is, there's no magic silver bullet for it. You cannot really, you know, dramatically slash the complexity in, in order of magnitude. But you can iteratively keep changing APIs, keep changing approaches. For example, we introduce SQL support, really native SQL support. No custom SQL, no bastardized version of that. Nothing special, just a straight out SQL NC99 to access the data. That gives tremendous simplification. By the way, it works in distributed fashion. You know, we introduced, like, you know, if you look at CockroachDB and Google Apps Spanner, we're the third project that introduced a true na native uh, distributed SQL. So you don't have to really think too much about, you know, querying your data or processing your data. We introduced machine learning on the same platform, so you don't have to do uh, a lot of. Um, ETLing and moving stuff around. But complexity is a big, big deal. It's something that, you know, me personally, I almost have a vendetta against complexity. Uh, there's a, quite a few folks here from Apache Ignite Project and Gain Systems. You can talk to them and they'll tell you the same story that complexity is what we're basically fighting on a daily basis. We try to make system not simplistic, but easier to use. And it comes from many different angles from very basic API changes and the better documentation, which is very obvious, all the way to a much better management tool, operational tools and whatnot. So this is basically uh, where I believe uh, the four major trends would be. Let's just recap those again. So we're gonna basically see, and again, uh, just to recap those four basic trends that I believe would be uh, very, very important going forward for memory computing systems and really for all of us to advance it. The adoption of a new type of RAM technology, products and technologies, right? We talked about Intel Optane and all the different types of RAM. Um, supporting hybrid transactional processing in a multi-model. Again, that's a big deal. Those are a little bit of a business-driven things, but again, just like a new types of RAM, the HTAP and multi-model, it's a long-running trend. It's not going to just happen overnight. It's not going to happen next year or not. There's nothing to deliver. There's no products around. Those are kind of semantic values. You know, we, we will eventually gradually move into this area. But again, this move is accelerating. You know, something that HTAP or, you know, translitical in terms of Forrester uh, terminology has been just a marketing, you know, bluff, you know, five years ago. Today, we're literally talking to the customers probably in the, like once a month who have a precise use case where you're trying to combine both analytical and transactional processing into the one. Cloud enablement, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, is a big, big deal. And it's inevitable. It's something that 
in memory computing, especially you know traditional vendors from in memory data grids are lagging, and uh, something I'm pretty sure most of us working very very actively as we speak to really remedy this and really deliver the products in this category. And last, but for me personally, the most important, even you know what I've been through in the years and the years and the years, is user friendliness and, and simplification of the memory computing. Again, it's very gratifying to think that we're top of the cream, that people that use this stuff and develop this stuff, it bodes bad for business. If you really want adoption of a technology beyond just the Silicon Valley and, and, and the bright people around the world, if you really want adoption in the real businesses, you have to make it approachable. You have to make it simple to use. And that's you know, one of the, my kind of greatest trends that I personally like to see in the future. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much.